we look at the Quran and if we look at the Sunnah of Al-Mustafa alayhi salatu salam and we look at the juhud of the ulama of Islam, we find that you have to make your environment. You, you, don't, you don't sit around making excuses. And we take it back to the Anbiya. We look at Musa alayhi salatu salam. Imagine because we live in an environment where many times things are against us. You know, the, the fitna is around us. Uh, Islamophobia is around us. The LGBTQXYZ, X, whatever, LGTV uh, is, is against us, right? They have, they're, they're pushing these agendas down people's throats. You know, people are always constantly, you get like, you know, atheists and Christian apologists always making up lies and all kinds of things. And sometimes we think, okay, how are we going to deal with this environment and the social pressures and how am I going to not be ashamed of being a Muslim? How am I going to pray in public? How am I going to walk around with hijab and khimar and abaya and niqab in an environment where people think I'm oppressed? And how am I going to grow a beard and make salah when people think I'm extreme? And all these shubuhat and doubts that, that these waswas of shaitan that we get, the answer to that is go back to the kitab of Allah. Tadabburan, like contemplate. Look at what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told us in the Quran. Go back to the seerah of Al-Mustafa alayhi salatu salam. Look at the life of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Look at the lessons. Don't just read there like, oh, they, take the lesson from it. And look at the juhud, the effort that the ulema of Islam, they put forth for this deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm going to mention these three. The first I'm going to mention is from the Anbiya of the past, which is Musa alayhi salatu salam. Imagine you are born in a place that you, your whole people, the Muslims of that time, bin Israel, the Muslims of that time are enslaved. Meaning the people of Fir'aun, they owned bin Israel. And they would commit horrible acts. I'm not going to be explicit but you can read between the lines that would violate the rights of the women that would go to the point that they could walk into your house and make unalive your children in front of you and you wouldn't say anything. Like, subhanallah, like sometimes we think, oh, it's too hard and oh, we're going through such a hard time. No, this ummah has been through much worse. That was the ummah of, of Islam of that time. Today, I have my son Yusuf with me. And I'll tell you, if somebody comes into my house and wants to touch even a hair on the head of any of my children, well, I'm not letting them. I don't care who they are. We got Second Amendment in America. You know? <laughs> you know, we're not letting them. I don't care what happens. Right? But... Bin Israel was that much under khawf. They were that fearful of Fir'aun and his power and his military and his might and his government that he could come into your house and take your firstborn child that was born in that year and you wouldn't say anything. Imagine that. And in that environment, as we know, I mean, I'm not going to get into details. You have Sheikh Idris here. I'm sure he's taught you so much already about this. May Allah bless him and protect him and bless your environment. They would, every year they would alternate. One year they would let the children live so they can have slave labor. And the next year they would kill based on when they predicted that Musa alayhi salam was being born. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could have made Musa alayhi salam be born at a time that they weren't doing it, but Allah ordained it that he was born in the year that they would. To show the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The mother of Musa alayhi salam, she has to now protect this child. She could have taken him and put him in the wilderness. She could have taken him and smuggled him out of Egypt. But Allah ordained it that she would throw him in the river, which would lead him straight to the house of Fir'aun. Look at the lesson here that the enemy of Allah of the time, Fir'aun, 
Volume, oppressor, murderer, the, the horrible, I mean, the crimes that he committed. You know, people go nowadays, Muslims, they go in the pyramids, and, ah, take pictures of. That's Fir'aun, Zulam. Those pyramids were built at the blood and, and, and sacrifice of the Muslims of that time. What are you proud of? We are from the land of Fir'aun. What? Be from the land of Musa alayhi salam. Don't be proud of Tahut and Tullam and oppressors. Fir'aun, he was that strong, he had that power, that fear, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it that Musa alayhi salam was raised in the house of Fir'aun. Under his nose, under his supervision, Allah ordered that the Nabi of Allah be raised. And then when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him wahi, when he was given the order to give da'wah, and we know the story, he wasn't told, okay, run away, go hide somewhere. No, idhab ila fir'aun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Quran tells him, no, 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 go back to that fir'aun and give him da'wah. By yourself. So that's what I'm saying. You need to build your environment. Don't worry about what's going on outside. Make your environment. You have a masjid, you have brothers, you have sisters, you have shiuch. Build this beautiful environment that you, you don't worry about what the media is saying and you don't worry about what TV is saying and you don't care about peer pressure and you don't care where the world is going and what colors they're wearing and all of that nonsense. You worry about your akhirah. You build your dunya to be based to make your akhirah, Musa alayhi salam, he went to Fir'aun, he faced Fir'aun, Fir'aun with all his tries, couldn't harm him. With all his magicians, and his armies, and his militaries, he couldn't harm him. Hmm? Musa alayhi salam, he didn't sell out the religion. He didn't say, brothers, we live in a time that we have to compromise, and we have to become like them, and we have to dress like them, and we have to act like them, and let's pretend to be like the people of Fir'aun, so we can influence the political powers of Fir'aun, and, and let's hide the fact that... No! He told them, you are a taghiyah. Make tawbah, turn back to Allah, straight. Who became victorious? Huh? Fir'aun? Who? Musa alayhi salam. Till today, who do we name our children after? Fir'aun? You ever met anybody named Fir'aun? Musa alayhi salam. Who will have the akhirah? Who will be in the high levels of Jannah? Fir'aun? No, Musa alayhi salam. Then we see, to the time of Rasulullah, Mustafa alayhi salatu salam. In the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, the dunya was on shirk. I mean, there were a handful of people, and we discussed this in the Sirah Durus, that were still on Tawheed, individuals. But on a mass level, the Yahud had sold out their religion. They would have all kinds of shirk and things, and you can read about what they were doing. The Nasara, the Christians were worshipping Jesus. They were making shirk. The Arab, they were mushrikeen. They were worshipping idols. The Ajam, the non-Arabs, were all mushrikeen. The Persians were worshipping fire. The Romans were worshipping Jesus. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in those dhulumat, in that darkness of shirk, he ordered one man, a human being, Muhammad ibn Abdullah alayhi salatu salam, Ya ayu al-mudathir, qum, fa'andir, wa rabbuka fa'kabbir. Oh you, that you're wrapped up, get up, stand up, and go and warn all of mankind, and speak about the greatness of your Lord. Imagine one man against the world. No army, no political parties, no financial backing, no lobbies, no political clout. 
the environment is such filth. Like you talk about environments, the, the environment of Mecca at that time was so bad that a woman would have multiple partners and then she would just choose one. You, you're the daddy. You know, like they have those shows, you know, you are the father. But there was no DNA test. You're rich, you're the one. They would have zulum, oppression. Imagine an environment where they would bury their own daughter. An environment where if you didn't have tribal support, your blood meant nothing. No police, no court, no judges, no king, no government, chaos. And in that darkness, the nur of Tawheed, the nur of Islam, it was put up as the responsibility of one man. One man, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, he goes out and he begins his da'wah. Against all odds. And every side attacks him. The Yahud, we know, Banu Qawnuqa, Banu Nadir, Banu, yani we, we know the, 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 the tricks they played. The, the Romans, the Christians, and the threats that they put before Tabuk and after, the Persians and their attacks, the Arab tribes in Khandak, from every side they attack. Who did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make victorious? Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Today, there is not a city in the world you don't hear, whether in the masjid or outside the adhan, there is not a place, I've been all over the world in many, many places, places that I would never imagine that are Muslims. Alhamdulillah, you will find masajid, you will find Muslims. Today, the fastest growing religion in the world, even with all the propaganda, with all of that is Islam. Today we see, whether on YouTube or TikTok or Instagram, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving nusra to this haqq, to this deen, Upon the tongues of the du'at, you see influencers and sports stars and people who you would think would just be lost in this dunya that they could be enjoying, entering the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, making salah and going for hajj and umrah and so on. Why? Because this is the deen of haqq and it will spread. And when I talk about Musa alayhi salam, and when I talk about Sayyidina Nabina Muhammad alayhi salatu salam, Maybe you will think to yourself, well, okay, those were anbiya, those were prophets. They were chosen by Allah as prophets. I'm not a prophet, what about me? And that's why I will mention a third example. A man who was not a Nabi, who was not a prophet. He was not a Sahabi. A man named Ahmad ibn Muhammad ibn Hanbal. Famously known as Ahmad ibn Hanbal. He was one man, a scholar, at a time where a fitna engulfed the Ummah. The fitna of the Mu'tazila. The fitna of Khalq al-Qur'an. Where they started to change the Aqeedah of Islam. And they started to say the Qur'an is makhluq. And they wanted to put their aql al naql. They wanted to put their own deduction over obedience to the Quran and Sunnah. So they brought a fitna where they would try to dispute that the Quran is the words of Allah, meaning being perfect. And we see these fitna today from progressives and liberals and those people that want to change our religion. They want to always make everything up for you know, khilaf and everything up for discussion and they made Islam into like a like a buffet platter, like I'll take this, but I'm good on that, I'll take this and I don't want that. No, no, that's not the way Islam works. Islam is Aslama. I submit to what Allah has ordered. It's Islam, not His Islam. It's not His opinion that He's going to make what Islam wants to be. No, it's Islam, Aslama, I submit. Qal Allah, khalas. Qala Rasul alayhi salatu salam. That's it. We, we follow it. So Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, he's not a Nabi. 
He doesn't have wahi. But he stands firm. And at that time, the ulema of Islam, the great scholars, they split into three categories. Some of them, they left. They left Baghdad, they left that area, they made hijrah to Misr, for example, a Shafi'i and other a'imma and ulema, they were on the right aqidah, they were on the right manhaj, but they realized that this is going to be such a tribulation, they left. And some of them, they sold out. When that pressure of the sword comes to the neck, when that pressure of money and the fear of jail and the fear of the whip is put, it cracks people. Some of them sold out. And some of them, they didn't sell out themselves, but they said what they had to say to survive. Even if their own aqidah wasn't that, but they said whatever the Khalifa told them to say, because they didn't want to be put in that hardship. Only two men stood firm. Muhammad ibn Nuh and Ahmad ibn Hanbal. And they were in prison. The way of the haqq, nobody told you it's going to be easy. <laughs> you think Jannah is cheap? Wallahi no. It's a ghali. It's expensive. You know, a lot of times when we're doing da'wah, we get this question of the problem of evil or the problem of suffering. And people come, if there is a God, why is there suffering on earth? What? <laughs> Who told you the earth's going to be all roses and, 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 and ice cream and you know, enjoyment? Where, where did you get that guarantee from? No, the earth, this dunya, this life of this dunya is a struggle. This is a fitna, this is a trial, this is a tribulation, this is a test. Which has no value in the sight of Allah. This life has no value in the sight of Allah. As the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told us that the, if the worth, if the worth of this dunya in the sight of Allah was like the wing of a mosquito even, if, then Allah would not have given the kuffar a sip of water to drink. But it has no value. That's why Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said about dhahab and fiddah, you know, when you take the masail of eating in, in dishes of gold and silver, why it's haram. He said, Lahum fi dunya wa lakum fil akhir. Let the kuffar have it in this dunya. But for you, it will be in the akhirah and the hereafter where it's everlasting. You know, some of these guys that we see, influencers and things like this, that you guys see on TikTok or Instagram or you, know, you see them on Twitter. I've gotten to know some of them, you know, giving them da'wah. Alhamdulillah, some of them are Muslim today, alhamdulillah. And some of them, they are Muslim and they haven't announced it yet. Inshallah, you will see them announcing when they're ready to, we're not pushing them. And some of them are not Muslim, but we still give them da'wah. And I didn't know them before, but now that I know them, sometimes you meet them and you find out about them and you'll be shocked at how fake their lives are. You know, sometimes you see these guys with Lamborghinis and Ferraris and you're like, wow, look at that guy, he's 19 and he's got a Lambo and he's got this big pad and I'm sitting here doing nothing, I wish I could be like him. But what you don't know is that he rented that Lambo for a few hours. He rented the Lambo, took pictures, tweeted it, put it on Instagram, put it on TikTok Live, drove it around, then gave the key back, thank you, where's my Accord so I can go home? <laughs> My 2000 Accord. <laughs> Great cars, by the way. 2000 Accords. <laughs> you see this house with this big beach and a pool, an infinity pool, and he's making rap videos and this and that. And then when the video is over, wraps up, gives the keys back, gets his deposit, goes home to his apartment. And you're sitting there going, wow. <laughs> you know, subhanAllah, we were giving dawah to this person who's. And he's famous. He makes reactions with his mom on YouTube. Not going to mention the name. And Alhamdulillah, he's Muslim. And he became Muslim. And when he became Muslim, the day he became Muslim, Allah, he was crying. 
And he was telling her, he goes, I've never felt at ease in my life like when I put my head on the ground. It's all my life with money and wealth and fame and women and drugs and everything else. I've never felt a sakina, a peace, like the first time I went and I put my head on the ground. That's the real success. So Ahmad ibn Hanbal, when him and Muhammad ibn Nuh are arrested, right in the beginning of the trial, Muhammad ibn Nuh dies. Naturally, he dies. So now imagine, you got the kuffar against you anyway. You got Yahud and Nasara and Mushrikeen and Hindus and all that against you. But even in the Muslim Ummah at that time, the Khilafah is against you. The military is against you, the Muslims. And in the whole area, in that area of the Ummah, now you're one man. Against the Khalifa, against everybody. And you're standing on the Haq. Make your environment. Don't sit there and wait. Be on the Quran, be on the Sunnah, be on the way of the Salaf al-Ummah. And don't care about anybody else. Imam Ahmad was one man and he stood firm. You know Imam Ahmad, they told him that the Khalifa will kill you. You'll be put to death. I said, that's okay. I'll be shaheed. I'm on the right aqidah, I'm on the Quran, I'm on the Sunnah. If I'm put to death, I'll be shaheed. He said, he'll imprison you. He said, that's okay. Because my house and the prison are the same. SubhanAllah, like think about the zuhud. At the prison cell, you know, prison cell, no furniture, no nothing, right? He said, that and my house is the same. Didn't care. He said, they'll put you to the fitna of the whip. And the whip, that's a fitna. Why? It's not like, well, you know, we're here like, oh, hey, I'm going to whip you. No. I don't know, the whip was such that when it hit your body, it would rip your skin. The man who the Khalifa at the time told him to whip, he said, in 10 hits, I could kill an elephant. With 10 cracks of my whip, I could kill an elephant. He said, this is the one. So they told Imam Ahmad, you're going to be hit with the whip. So Imam Ahmad, he said, look, I don't mind becoming shaheed. Alhamdulillah, this dunya is temporary. I don't mind being in prison. That's my khalwa with Allah. But... He said, I felt uncomfortable about the whip because it's going to rip your skin. And at that time, while he was in prison, a man named Abu Hatim, Abu Haytham, he was going through the crowd. Where is Ahmad ibn Hanbal? Where is the Shaykh? Where is that Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal? And he was a big man. People feared him. Imam Ahmad didn't know who he was. He told him, I'm Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Why? So the man said, look, I am a bandit, a robber, a drunk, I do everything haram, <laughs> and I've been whipped many times. And I still stood firm on my sins. And you are on the haq, you're on the truth, so be firm on the truth. If I can be patient on my sins, you can be patient on the haq. Imam Ahmad used to say, may Allah have mercy on him, nobody's words gave me more consol than him. Imam Ahmad said, after that, I was not afraid of him. You know, they, 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 they used to not give him food at night and he would fast in the day. And they would make him tied to such chains with heavy metal balls that, that he would have to take the drawstrings from his the silwar to wrap it, to lift them up to be able to walk. And they would bring him in front of a panel of the Mu'tazila, of these scholars who were eloquent in their Arabic, who were well fed by the, by the, by the Khalifa, they were, they were getting all that scraps, the scholars for dollars kind of a thing. And they would be well rested, slept, and they would be ready. And they would bring Imam Ahmad starving, tired, in prison. And they would debate. And Allah gave him that Nusra that never once did he slip. Everything they said, he repeated with the ayah of Quran or a hadith sahihah. And when they would bring their kalam and their logic, he would tell them, no, I'm not going to respond to that. Bring, bring an ayah from the Quran 
bring a hadith, then I will respond. And Allah made it that He would destroy their arguments. The whole panel, He would destroy them. So they said, have him whipped. SubhanAllah, the man that could kill an elephant with 10 hits. He whipped him more than 70 times. You know, it's not a fairy tale. It's not Hollywood. It's not DC Comics or Marvel or Avengers. I mean, he got hit with a whip that ripped his skin even on his face. Even on his face. Wallahi, when you guys go out there and say, oh, it's too hard to be Muslim or, oh no, my God, they might make fun of me. Imagine Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Imagine the whip comes and rips your face open. Imam Ahmad, till his death, he had the scars on his face. And they used to take his flesh that was ripped with the whip because the whip cut you. And they didn't have anesthesia and things like this to you. So they would take metal hooks and put them together, lift up the skin, cut it and solder it with hot burning metal. And he was patient on the deen. Until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made him victorious without fighting, without causing revolutions or bloodshed, but with, with being firm on the haqq. Today that aqid of the Mu'tazila is finished. Alhamdulillah, even if some of the people of Bid'ah want to bring it back, it's finished. And the Ummah is on the right, Aqeedah of the Qur'an being Kalam Allah. Why? Because the firmness of one man. He made his environment. My respected brothers and sisters in Islam, I'm here in front of you, not because I'm deserving to speak. You have Tullab, Ilm and Shuyukh here that are more deserving. But as a reminder, myself, I was raised in San Diego, California and the hoods and barrios and all of that. And I saw a situation in the Ummah that people are in need of Islam. People are in darknesses, in depression, in, in dhulumats. People are lost in drugs and alcohol and, and, and trying to chase desires that will never fulfill their needs. People are, 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 are or as if, you know, a blind person in a dark night banging their head against walls, trying to find a path, trying to find Sakina and not finding it. And we as Muslims have that light of Tawheed. We have that knowledge of what Islam is about, what this life is for, what is the purpose of life. And if we don't share that light, Wallahi, we will be held accountable. And I'm sick of excuses. You know, I, I sat around listening to people blaming a king and blaming a government and blaming an organization and blaming a sheikh and blaming the Arab and blaming the Ajam and blaming this and blaming that and sitting around and complaining about the Ummah and complaining about this and that. And you know, I was like, I'm done with that. Like, like what's that going to do? So we went out. We started giving da'wah in the streets. No organization, no funding, no money, nothing. Just went out, started talking to people. And alhamdulillah, from just me standing by myself on a street corner, we got brothers that started joining. Alhamdulillah, we started putting funds together. May Allah reward our brothers who put the organization side of it. I wasn't involved in any of that. They put together OMF, we went and started joining with the brothers. May Allah bless them and reward them. And as we started to grow, some of the brothers said, you know what, let's start recording the videos. And I remember going, why? Nobody wants to watch me talking to a bunch of guys at a park. And the brothers were like, no, it'll be good, good for people to see the answers. Like, all right. Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it that in that worst of areas. America is one of the worst environments you can imagine. In the places where the whole LGBTQ fitna began in California, in areas where Crips and Bloods and all of that began, where the whole center of all that gang world began, where all NWA and Compton and all of that Southern California, all of that Dhulumat in that place, Alhamdulillah, the da'wah grew. And we changed an environment. 
and we built an environment of durus and halaqat and ilm and we have Zad al and Lummat al Atiqad and Alhamdulillah Akhtar al Mukhtasarat and we have Nukhbat al Fikr and we started Durus. And, and in the beginning, nobody let me. No masjid allowed me. I started teaching in my house. Got a couple of brothers together, two brothers. After Jum'ah, we would sit, go over some mutun. Alhamdulillah, we developed into the masajid. Alhamdulillah, we started to grow. Then our da'wah grew. Now, alhamdulillah, in the last two and a half years, we've had more than 4,000 shahadas that we know about. 4,000 people, alhamdulillah, just from us, not including people that watched the videos and became Muslims that we don't know. Right now, I was in Melbourne. I met three different brothers. Each one of them said, you know, I became Muslim just from watching your videos. Brothers like that, we don't know how many. So what is the point? The point is, build your environment. Don't sit around complaining about where society is going, change it. And if you can't, if you're not a governor, if you're not a prince, that doesn't matter. Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal wasn't a king or a prince or a governor. You know, he was a regular person, but he seeked that knowledge. So that's the first step. Seek knowledge. Alhamdulillah, you have durus, you have halaqat here, gain that knowledge. Don't lose that opportunity. Secondly, take that knowledge, implement it into your own life. Act upon it. Don't gain knowledge so you can show off and get on TV and you know, get subscribers. Like, What's that going to help you in the Akhirah? Thirdly, share that knowledge. You see a Muslim, he's off. Remind him, brother, what are you doing in the, in the hookah bar? Salah is tonight. We have Salah and Jama'ah. What are you doing here? Wasting your time you know, in a club. Don't you know there's a masjid? Don't be ashamed. Don't be like, oh my God, he'll think of... No, man, be a man about it. Be firm about it. I mean, look at those Salaf al-Salihin and all that they went through. You think they were worried about what people thought? Go, you see non-Muslims, go share Islam with hikmah, with wisdom, so you can be good, protective citizens of this country. And if you want good for Australia, then share Islam with them. What can be better than to be guided to the truth? Wallahi, you know, I'll, I'll tell you this thing in, in, in closing before we open up for the q and I was in Canada and I met a brother there. And this brother, subhanAllah, he was involved in the Mexican cartels. Didn't know any Muslims. Didn't know any Muslims. He was involved in all kinds of like the worst crimes you can think of not just making people unalive but in the worst ways you can imagine horrible torturous crimes didn't know any muslims was involved in a life that you can't even imagine where police can't stop you where you know governments have no power over you where you can do whatever you want to anybody and you know, money and all these kinds of things. But living that life had him depressed, have him ha had him on anxiety. He was taking medications, couldn't sleep, always walking, looking over his shoulder, having nightmares of the things he had done. And subhanAllah, somebody, a non-Muslim, shared with him my video about my life. A non-Muslim, just share, hey, you know, this, this guy is interesting, look at this guy. And he watched that video, and he made tawbah, not even knowing what Islam is. He repented from that life, he left it, he started to search more of the videos, found out about Islam, left that life, had to leave Mexico because they were going to unalive him for leaving. He went to Canada, and he stayed there. When I met him, mashallah, he had a beautiful beard, nur on his face, like, you know, dressed proper Islamic attire in the masjid. I would have thought that he just graduated from Medina. And when I spoke to him, he was crying. He told me his life. He said, look, I became Muslim just from watching. I didn't know any Muslims. He says, I got to Canada to get away from that stuff. I just Googled where is the masjid, went to the masjid, said I want to be Muslim.